The influencer marketing industry is set to grow to approximately 21 billion in 2023. And according to a survey by Influencer Marketing Hub, 23% of their respondents intend to spend more than 40% of their entire marketing budget on influencer campaigns. Yet it remains a complex area with many marketing leaders trying to figure out where it sits and how to measure it properly. Hi, I'm Connor Byrne, and you are listening to That's What I Call Marketing, the podcast where you will hear from the leading lights in the marketing world and listen to their unique insights. So today I'm talking all things influencer with Vanessa Sawyer, founder of the agency Get Stuff Done, where she is the matchmaker of multicultural talent and brands. Her agency's focus is to amplify multicultural voices through influencer marketing and beyond. Vanessa has appeared on BBC News and Channel 5, been a guest on the podcast series Influence, a judge for the annual Blogosphere Awards, and she's a regular speaker and expert on all things influencer business. So today I talked to Vanessa about her views on the influencer marketing space, the roles these creators play in the lives of those that follow them, and that's not too overstated, but really thinking about what brands make sense for creators to work with and how chasing the money just doesn't really work for them. Vanessa has some wonderful advice for creators who are starting out, but some stark warnings to people about some of the representatives that are out there. And we get into some wonderful real life examples of her work with her clients like Lavana Back, Flavia Benko and Ashley Louise, and the work they're doing with brands. And we also talk incredibly about Vanessa's near death experience. I really hope you enjoy this episode. Vanessa, thanks a million for joining me on That's What I Call Marketing. It's great to have you here. No, thanks for having me. I'm really, really excited. Yeah, brilliant. Well, listen, let's get straight into it. I'd love to hear a bit about you, your story. and But first of all, let's start with Get Stuff Done. Tell me a bit about Get Stuff Done and um, what it's all about and what you're hoping to achieve. Yeah, so Get Stuff Done is a influencer marketing agency we represent talent and our niche is representing multicultural talent so at the moment we've got talent that are of african caribbean and south asian heritage based in the uk and my whole goal and vision is to amplify multicultural voices and experiences in um in the uk and beyond and from small screen to big Amazing. And you obviously, you know, you've set this up for, for a reason, right? You, you're going, you know, you're doing this for a reason. Underrepresentation is a, is a huge issue in the influencer marketing creator space. 100%. Um, I, I feel like, yes, we all live in the UK, but we are, for want of a better saying, a melting pot of experiences. So the way I would put it is, my husband and I are both African background, but his is um, black African from Ghana and mine is South Indian heritage from Mauritius. Okay. So culturally, we have a lot of crossovers, food, etc. But our household is still uh, is still mixed in terms of cultures, whereas my next door neighbours, they are English from the north of England and their household is very different from ours. So I want to be able to showcase that with the creators that we represent and the talent that we, that, that um, the creators we represent and the, the content that we create. Yeah. yeah. And then am I right? Do I hear a Scottish accent in there? Yeah. Just to mix it up a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've be, actually been in London for, I'm trying to figure it out last night, I think like 23 or 24 years, so more than half my life, so my accent is definitely softer than um, it would be if I was living in Glasgow, however, we have a, a Glasgow contingent in London, so when we get together, it is Glasgow Returns. <laughs> <laughs> like the elevation of the accent, just, I adore the Scottish accent. Um Thanks. My my aunt was from from Scotland and just you know as a child then I was like that's the most because she's the most beautiful person I was like that's the most yeah. beautiful accent in the world yeah. so there you go it's lovely <laughs> so I'd love to understand a bit about I guess, some of the 
I guess, core marketing beliefs that you have that you apply to the work that you do? Like what are the things that you kind of believe are really important from a marketing perspective when you're working with brands and, and creators? And I, I hate to say it, but it's authenticity. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, it, it, the truth is for me, everything in the world comes down to is underpinned by common sense. And I know people will say that common sense isn't common, but for me, it's like if you are, we buy based on recommendation before influencer marketing, mm -hmm. there was word of mouth. And for me, influencer marketing is the the evolution of word of mouth, right? So <clears throat> for me, the belief is authenticity. I will tell you that we went to the most amazing restaurant. You have to go there and mm -hmm. this is the food. And you, because you trust me, you believe me, and because we're friends, you're going to go. And if I've told you a lie, you'll come back and go, <laughs> never going to trust you again. Yeah. So we just need to be really authentic with the content that we're creating and, and the reviews and the opinions and everything that we're putting out there, good, bad, or indifferent. I feel like there's an element, a large percentage of influencers or creators, they're so caught up in money. Mm -hmm. that they're chasing the money that yeah. it's like oh this person's doing really well I'm gonna follow them but it's so not it's so not who they are as an individual you know yeah and I feel like we need to go back to that let's tell the truth because people can see through it and that's where we then come around to de-influencing you know which is yeah. really annoying <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> um it's, like it's interesting on that point of like the the restaurant example is a brilliant one i i did hospitality many 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 years ago and actually i nearly i didn't go into because i nearly burnt a restaurant down but anyway that's a whole other story <laughs> <laughs> yeah um i was not a great chef uh but in in college we had a lecture and at the time there was no social media there was no mobile phones right i'm really yeah. aging myself here um but he used to say, like, if someone comes into your restaurant and has a good experience, this is the difference, right? If they have a good experience, they'll tell nobody, right? If they have a bad experience, they'll tell nine people. Now, I think the stat was made up, but his point was the bad experience actually got out there faster. But what kind of is interesting there, maybe with, with influencers, um, is they're, they're, they seem to tell the good story, right? And so actually that bad, so if they're working with, the, uh, let's say, a restaurant and they're going in and they're having an experience, if they've bad experience, they're probably not going to tell that because it might reflect badly on them as, oh, don't work with them. They'll tell the truth. Like, is that a, is that a big challenge that, that has to be overcome? And how, how do you overcome it? Ooh. So, yes, it's a huge, it's a, <laughs> it's a, how do you it's a biggie. <laughs> um, it is, it's a huge, it's a huge challenge. And naturally, um, marketeers are not going to gravitate to those that are fully truthful because of the fear but we need to overcome the fear we need to go as much with the good and the bad and I agree with you I think you know one bad experience or thing outweighs 10 good things however yeah. what we need to remember is it's all about that nurturing with the relationships and these influencers have built a community and if you just tell them all the good stuff, they're going to drop off. They're not going to trust you. So you absolutely need to be telling the truth. And from a brand's perspective, own it. Yeah. Rather than worry about, you know, because people are going to go out there and bad mouth your brand anyway, or their experience. Just own it. Come back and say, right, be public about it. Get together with that influencer and say, how can we do better? Record that experience, put it out there and say, you know what? We heard what you said. We know that you're influential. What can we do better? Come in. Let me give you a consultant job. You know, like work with the influencer to say how it can be done better. Don't leave it out there for everyone to say, oh, I'm never going there again or I'm never buying that. Or, you know, because you've got a bigger hill to climb then, you know, yeah. for the next launch that you do or the next product that you bring out. 
you've got a bigger hill to climb. Nip it in the bud, bring the person in, and you will gain traction from that influencer's audience as well. Yeah. Because they'll turn around. They literally will turn around and go, my God, did you see that brand? That was great because that's what audiences do. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it, and again, it probably goes back to that authenticity piece. Can't say that. Um, but uh, <laughs> it's hard for an Irish person. Um, but, you know, that piece of saying, yeah, we've, we've done, we haven't done it well. And we can, we can do, there's loads of examples of brands that do that. And people do, you know, really enjoy that. I did want to ask one question actually, before we go too far into it. Influ- is it influencer? Is it creator? You know, what's the, what is the right term? And not that it's massively important, but I'm just interested because it seems to be, I know TikTok are like, well, they're, they're creators and influencers. So like, what is the, is it, does it matter or is it just like kind of. I don't think it matters to be honest. Everyone's creating content and everyone is influential. Yeah. That's it at the end of the day. I'm not a content creator, nor am I a influencer in the true, you know, meaning of the term is being put out there. However, I do create content and I do influence people, namely my husband. <laughs> yeah, micro influencer, but an influencer. <laughs> <laughs> um so a question then for, I, I think a lot of brands and marketing organizations struggle a bit with where this sits. Is it PR and comms? Is it social? Is it performance? Like where, where does it sit in, in an organization? What's your view on that? I think it sits across all of the above. Like right. I feel, <laughs> sorry, I feel like, you know, why do we have to box everything? Because, you know, that's how we were taught. That's how, you know, companies were set up. But we can evolve. We literally can evolve. It's like, you know, my background in B2B marketing, for example, it was like there's marketing and there's sales. But we had to work together because it was like, you know, marketing was always seen as the lower run of the, you know, the hierarchy and then sales were up here because yeah. they drove sales, but so did we. And if we worked together, we drove more sales, right? So I feel like companies need to evolve in their mindset because yes, we need it, it sits in PR because there is that broader piece yeah. of creating awareness, but absolutely we're doing it to drive sales. So then it has to, you know, we have to look at the marketing piece and we have to look at the data. So it sits across all of them. Yeah. And so then when a brand is, you know, thinking about this, because I don't think it, uh, sorry, this is wrong. Um, it's not, I don't think all brands think about it. I, I think possibly younger, newer brands are able to uh, do this faster because, the, you know, they can see that it has, has a place. And I, there's some great <laughs> examples of, of brands that do that. Um, but maybe it's for some of the more mature brands. They that's where they kind of struggle. And and what would your advice, or if you're talking to somebody in kind of a a large organisation that hasn't really got their head around this, what would you say to them about how to get started and how to think about it? I would say to them, work with an agency that knows what they're doing, and bring that agency in to work with you, as opposed to just you know giving the marketing we need to do influencer marketing giving it to them learning doesn't stop right we have to continuously learn and that also means in the larger organizations because the truth is if we don't do that as the the older generation that may be us or one above us um you know, as they start to retire out of those roles and the new people come in, their mindset is different. They are going to struggle in the traditional marketing PR setup, mm-hmm. you know? So yeah. they need to work with organizations, work with agencies, bring them in-house almost so that they can set up a new, you know, new kind of way of working. Yeah, and actually it's really interesting that point, like, you know, we, we have to do influencer marketing. Like it's probably just the wrong starting point. Like it's the wrong question to ask or, you know, the wrong conversation is, oh, we should do influencer marketing. What, like why? why? You know, like I, it probably goes back to all the good stuff. Like what's the business challenge? And then can influencer marketing be a part of that answer? And what is that, you know, how, how does that look then? Yeah, 100%. And, and, 
and then to the, the other point you were making there about kind of maybe a newer, younger generation, like have their heads around this. And so, you know, even within an organization, I think talking to people who are living it, you know, yeah. I, I have a team in Australia and there's, there's a girl on the team who is, you know, fascinated by food. And so she uses her Instagram and she posts about, you know, her food experience. And she's, you know, a, a bit of an influencer in that, in that space. And it, fascinating her bringing that world into our world of, of mm -hmm. work and saying here's some ideas i think we could do and you're like wow like, that's not you know oh i never thought mm -hmm. of it but it's just she gets it and so i yeah. think that's even the agency model as well is where where you don't have that skills bringing an agency in that that does can can really help um and then how do you think about to that point of the reach of influencers like there's different types we talked you know the micro influencer to the the large scale reach. How do you how do you think about that? And do you have different on on your roster of creators that you work with? Do you have kind of a range of large and small? So ours are mainly micro influencers. They always have been. Um, I say they always have been, but the agency's not from an influencer yeah. perspective hasn't been going that long. So <clears throat> yeah, they they're micro influencers, and for me, it's more about the community that they've built and the quality that they put out there and their work ethic. And then I'll work with them. If you are someone that's that's in that wants to become an influencer or is creating content for clout, um just to be seen and to, to chase that money. It's not someone that I, I personally would work with. So I think it's all about quality mm -hmm. and I think it's all about the engagement the, the true engagement that you have with your community. And I'm not talking about numbers. I'm literally talking about how you, what value do you provide to your, to your community, you know? Yeah. And then, then we've got something to talk about. Okay. That's interesting. So you're less concerned about if someone has 2000 or 20,000 or 200,000 followers, it's more about the, the, is it the engagement? And so then is that the metric you look like look at? So if they post something that the percentage of people that they that follow them that are engaging with them. Yeah, a hundred percent. One hundred percent because that's the true the true meaning of influencer, right? They're influencing people to engage with their content, whether it's to buy something or not. It's just someone to engage in that conversation. Conversation builds community, community builds opportunity. So yeah, that's that's very much how I look at it. And then, how do you work with brands on on the metric piece? Because that that's a huge piece, right? And I think we've, I think anything in the social space has always struggled, right? Because people are like, well, does that you know do likes yeah. matter? For example, yeah. right? And so with this, like, how do you engage with the brands you work with, the creators, to get meaningful results? And then, what are the, what are the metrics that you look at? I think the truth is where we are with the various different platforms, working with brands directly cuts the platform out. So no matter what quality, what metrics, the content is going to be downgraded um, on the platforms. We've seen it, everybody's seeing it. So the it's now about building the relationship with the brands and them seeing the relationship that the creator has with their audience. So yes, they're always going to ask me like follower numbers, um, you know, insights, et cetera, but it, I'm seeing it matter less and less now. I'm more about the engagement that they have prior to the actual ad going live, if that makes sense. So when we, we, we give the results back, they just want to see it, but there's never any or oh, disappointment or anything like that. They know what to expect. The platforms aren't making money when we go direct to the brand. So they know they have to spend money behind it or just know that they've got some great content and created some awareness out there. Okay. So the brands are less concerned with a sale, for example, right? You, you know, if you're working with, I, I don't know. Right. Okay. So their, their view is, so this falls more into probably awareness or consideration okay. for the brand that people are experiencing it. And so they're less 
concerned about the tracking the direct ROI. Yeah, I'm seeing it less and less. I'll be honest with you. You know, that's fascinating. Not, I, I know I'm 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 not so worried about the metrics at the moment. It's more about the quality, and that plays into where I see the industry or where I see creators moving. You know, um, as we move forward. I think that's fascinating, and and I say that in a in a world of, you know, I don't want to use the recession word, right? But but there's challenges, right? Like marketing budgets are are under pressure, right? And so the the attribution to revenue that I see across, you know, people I talk to and just my own organization it is it is intense, right? The the need to actually prove almost everything that we're doing has that return and so being able to say we're going to work with influencers but we can't actually attribute it like that seems like a massive hill for people yeah yeah it is i think as well you know traditionally from a marketing perspective i look forward to recession years you know because <laughs> Let's face it, they, the marketing budgets increase, right? We see we see more where maybe a consumer needs to see something nine times before they make a purchasing decision. In a recession year, they might need to see it 15 to 20 times. Therefore, marketing budgets increase accordingly. So for me, recession years have always been great. I loved it, especially working in sponsorship, you know. Um, this has been very different. This yeah. is the first time it's been very different where, you know, marketing budgets have been tighter, but we haven't seen a drop. In fact, like we've had the best start to a year than we've ever had before. Really? You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Like my forecast for the end of the year, I'm like, oh, we need to change that. Um, You know, we've had the best start. But again, I think it's being very specific about the content that we're creating and the creators that we work with to make sure that we're amplifying that multicultural experience in the UK. So I think maybe we have a different slant and that helps. Um, I don't know. I don't know is the honest truth. You know, our focus is very much to work with brands and with agencies to help them and make sure that when they're working with multicultural talent, that the briefs are right, for example, that they're culturally relevant. You know, so we're creating some strategic partnerships with some bigger agencies to make sure that we are part of that conversation, even at pitch stage, you know? Right. Okay. That, that is really, really interesting as well. I think the, the, the you know, um, being in, in a space where, you know, what's re sorry, what's interesting, I think what you're talking about is you've got a, you've got a very specific area of focus, right? You're working with people that are, true and authentic in that space and so for brands who are trying to navigate that space you know coming to you just makes a ton of sense right and, and actually probably doing it through broad reach advertising might be more difficult so this kind of what kind of brands are you working with so um we're working with skincare um baby brands so um can I mention brand names? Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, for example, um, for the last um, two years, we one of our creators, Flavia Benko, she's a mom, she's a flight attendant, she's a wife. I don't know how she does it all. Um, <laughs> she does it. And she creates the most exceptionally, exceptional quality videos. Um, she's been a brand ambassador for Dove for two years. We're going on okay. to the third year. Um, and uh, who else? We're working with Fisher Price. Um, I can't think. We work with a number of beauty brands at like Beauty Pie. We love Beauty Pie. We're at Beauty Pie. Um, I can't think. Skincare, yeah. lifestyle. You know, there's no, there's no limit. We've just signed up. Um, one of the ladies to. She's brand ambassador for Bosch for this year. So they're going to be showcasing some of their home oh. um, appliances, small home appliances, which is quite cool. So. Yeah, that's really, yeah. A very d different, like wide ranging. Yeah. And so then I, when when that works, you're obviously 
brands or, or agencies are coming to you, you know, with client X, business problem Y, and then you're kind of going, okay, I think I have, yeah. you know, this, this person or that person, or are they coming to you saying, we're really interested in this creator and we want to work with them? Or, like, wait, but, does it, or does it work both ways? Right, right. Both. And also, like, we're building a bigger creator network um, to, so that, you know, we can't represent everyone exclusively. Again, I'm not, I'm okay. not someone that's like, oh, they're amazing. I've got to represent them. I get a lot of people calling me for us to represent them, but you know, there's only so much I can do. And we put a lot into the people that we exclusively represent in order to grow them. So we're building a wider network because they don't, I feel like there's people creating great content out there. They're just, they don't appear in, you know, when it comes to the performance tools, they, they don't appear in those results. So I want to give them some opportunities. So we're building that network at the moment, which is great. We've got about coming on to 300 people on there and just building it out slowly. Amazing. Who do you admire in the space? Like what, what brands, bar the ones you work with, of course, who are all phenomenal. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but which brands do you think have done this well and have kind of got their heads around it so we have worked with with them um as i said for the last couple of years it's dove okay they've really really got their head around it and understood what like their ambassadors and bringing their community with them means to the brand and it's not just on the product side it's on the purpose side so you know, they've always had purpose built into yeah. the business, which I wasn't aware of, into the brand and um, really using their influencer community to raise awareness of those purpose driven goals, I think is has been great, you know. Um, so I think they do it exceptionally well. I think McDonald's as well do it exceptionally well. Oh, really? Uh, you know, we were part of their Raise Their Arches campaign. Where are you? Yeah, so one of the ladies that I represent, she her platform is actually Twitter. Um, oh. Her, <laughs> that's her primary. <laughs> I didn't mean to say, oh, I'm on Twitter, but like, oh. No, but again, <laughs> that's her primary platform. Um, and she's, she's grown a, a really loyal community there. Um, and brands are sleeping on it. You know, she's number one Twitter spaces host in the world. She does Love Island recaps every single night. The, oh, wow. You know, you've constantly got media on there looking for quotes for the next day regarding Love Island. And and she's the one that's driving that. And brands are very much sleeping on the value of Twitter at the moment. Yeah. Um, What's and her I name? understand why. Um, Ashley Louise. Okay. I have to so she Ashley has a, she has a show called Talks with Ash. And her oh, hashtag is often trending. That's yeah. brilliant. Yeah, I, I think you're, it, it is interesting. Twitter is is an interesting space at the moment because, you know, you see a lot of people kind of going, should we be on it? Should we not be on it? And, you know, it, it, it is, it's a, it's a challenge. I think it's a challenging one. And sorry, back to Dove. I think Dove is a fascinating yeah. brand. And I think, it, again, all the things you've talked about, it makes a lot of sense for Dove to be working, you know, with you and the creator because they've, they've been about that authentic message for so long. They're yeah. probably one of the first brands to read. Yeah. Oh, I'll get this wrong. But they were definitely an early brand thinking about purpose. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, and, you know, there's lots of questions about purpose, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, there was that famous thing, was it last year where one of the investors and, um, it, was it Unilever said like, you know, does Hellman's need a purpose more than just being mayonnaise you put on mayonnaise. a sandwich, right? But, so, but I think Dove had that kind of, they've, they've had some beautiful campaigns through the years and very effective work as well. They weren't just award winning, they, they were, they were great campaigns. So you can see yeah. why and how they would work with with influencers and in a more, you know, not that large scale, kind of, as you said, the, let's call the micro for yeah. want of a different term. Um, it is a risky space for brands. What can brands do to de-risk and, you know, in, engaging with, with um, creators and influencers? And I mean, and what I mean by that is you can't control what happens right. in their life. I mean, Correct. There's lots of examples. So what's your advice or thoughts on that? For me, it's building relationship with the community of influencers that you that you're working with and that you want to work with. 
you know, understand that they're not just a platform and they're not just a publisher for you. They're actually human beings and they have life issues and they've got, you know, they go through things. So understand that and, and treat them as human beings and not just as a number. However, I do understand that comes down to time as well. So often, you know, we work with some agency and the brand has given them two weeks to turn around and get content through the door. And it's like, I can't really care if she's sick. I just need the content. So I think there's a, there's a balance there. But for me, it's, it's everything is underpinned by relationships, right? I'm going to cough, excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and yeah, I mean, it is, I, I, I get that piece, but then, you know, what happens when the influencer or creator you're working with goes off and, you know, does something stupid, <laughs> you know, and goes and, and gets themselves, you know, messed up in country X and, you know, whatever, you know, how do you, what does a brand do in that situation? Right. And, you know, there's, again, there's tons of examples of, you know, big influencers, but also small ones that, that kind of make mistakes that then reflect ultimately badly on the brand that they're working with. I don't think it's any different from <clears throat> when, you know, they work with celebrities and VIPs and they oh, cut gosh, ties, yeah. you know, it's exactly the West, same. Right? <laughs> right, right, exactly. Um, <clears throat> so I, I don't think it's any different. You've got to look at your, your priority is the, the brand reputation at the end of the day. So an inf if an influencer is attached to you and they have, you know, made a mistake or, and even if they, you know, they're remorseful after at the end of the day, your priority, you can, you can reach out to them and have an honest conversation. But at the end of the day, brand reputation is the most important thing if you are the recruiting brand. So yeah. cut ties. It is what it is, you know? Yeah. Um, but again, there's a person at the end of that. So just have a conversation with them and say, this is what's going to happen. You know, we're fully supportive of you as an individual. However, this is business at the end of the yeah. day. Let's not get too caught up in the emotion of it. Yeah, and, and I guess there are other examples of people who have, you know, this has happened to them and, and you know, they come they come out the other side because, as you say, we're all human beings and exactly. we make mistakes. And I guess if you're in, if you're putting yourself out there, there's two parts. I think one, people are often looking to take you down. Yeah. Because I go, look at them. <laughs> look at them. They think they're brilliant. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there's that part. And so the people look for it. Um, I can't remember the second part, but there you go. I think they're, you know, I think it is an interesting, um, it's an interesting thing. But I, and, I, and I do think that, you know, companies, I think before they get into this space, it is something that they worry about. Like, well, what yeah. happens if, what happens if? And so that can hold people back as well. Yeah, but as I said, it's no different because brands have worked with celebrities and VIPs for years, so they know what to do in that circumstance to do exactly the same thing. There's no difference. Yeah, it is. It, it's definitely, it's a, it's a really interesting, interesting space. And I was reading, you know, Adidas potentially are going to lose a ton of revenue, yeah, right? And, yeah. you know, like it's, it, and nobody, they couldn't have seen that coming. That, you know, no, not at all. Do. Um. One of the things then is, do you, do you have any, not, not issues, but brands obviously have guidelines, right? We've got our yeah. brand guidelines. This is our voice. This is whatever. And then creators are creators and they want to create. How do you bring those two together so that it allows the creator, the, <laughs> it allows the creator the freedom to create, yeah. but that they're, you know, not hemmed in to the brand guidelines, but not going, you know, off. Is the guidance how, too far. Making sure that we get a creative concept agreed before we go ahead and film. That's, right. That that's that's the measure of it. You know, the <clears throat> creator has a look at the brief. They come back with a concept. I will share it. If the brand comes back and says no, we want to do X, Y, Z. There's always backwards and forwards. But at the end of the day, the response from me is always like the reason why you want to work with them is because of their content. If you try and put that in a perfect brand box, you may as well go down the route of actors, you know, just go and mm. 
you know, hire a space, do a casting, give them a script and let them do it that way. If you want to work with creators, allow them to do it in a voice that is authentic to them and recognizable by their audience. And then you'll get the traction that you're looking for. And it, uh, yeah, it go, probably going back to the, the trust and the relationship, build that relationship, build that trust and, and you'll find, and, yeah, you'll find it. And it, look, it is a, I think it's a challenge with any creative process. Like we were just chatting to an agency last night about kind of creating some concepts for us and, and more of a, a brand, you know, scale. And, and part of it was like, how do we, how do we articulate the brand values that we have, but without hemming them in to say, cause we need something quite different without hemming them in and saying, you have to stick to this. And so it's really, it, it's a tough one. And then I think you're right. Like that you say to them, look, we, we trust them and let's work together really closely yeah. because, um, you know, I said to them, I said, look, I, I please don't go away for three weeks and come back with an idea because it's, that'll just be disappointing for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> like, so of course. It, just, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Um, and in terms then of platforms, uh, interestingly, you know, mentioning obviously Twitter, um, Instagram, TikTok, are, are you working with people across all platforms? Do you see some working better for other things than, you know, do you, is Twitter better for one thing like the TV show or is Instagram better for food and fashion? <clears throat> I think from from my perspective, Twitter is um, is great now for actual conversation. Right. Obviously, people go backwards and forwards with their tweets, but actually, Spaces has created that platform for you know for conversation. <clears throat> Instagram is great for um, recommendation quality content. And Twitter is good for that. Can I, it's almost like the in between of the two. You know, you've got an opinion. You want you're you're quite happy to do it um, front facing, and you can do it on TikTok. Um, and also for trends, you know, um, TikTok definitely sets the 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 plat is the platform for setting trends for right. sure. Right. Okay. And um, are there any? we've kind of touched on it a bit like that there's there's a huge amount of um content out there and a lot of it just looks wonderful and people's lives are great and and, and all that are there any risks that we're creating for the audience like i so i have kids and y young kids but you know the daughter is 12 and she's not on social yet but that's coming right like you know and i worry about the you know, the exposure she'll get to the, to the perfect lives that people and creators put out there and the pressure it puts on them. And there's, this, you know, some horrendous stories of kids that have, you know, you know been badly impacted by that. And, and I worry about it. Do you feel there's, there's a risk of that we're creating this world that's so perfect and unrealistic? 100%. We fought for years about size zero in magazines. We've gone back there, whether it be like size zero or, you know, the hourglass with the BBL and, you know, abs 100 percent. We are create that the platforms are giving, you know, um, space for people to showcase unhealthy images of what yeah. life should be like. And it is down to the platforms to take responsibility for that. One hundred percent. And what I because here's my thing: I don't think they will. No, I don't think they will because there's too much money in it. Yeah. What can your not your your creators like? Do you think they have a role to play in it? I mean, I think that just goes back to them being who they are and being authentic and showing true life. You know. Um, Lavina back for example she's a new mom a new wife and she will be very honest about the the she's giving an unfiltered view of motherhood she, you know where she's ready to go out and stage sick all over her or you know stage had a punami explosion in the train when they were on the way to London she shows that very like okay. yes I'm a new mom and yes absolutely in love with my child 
and so is the whole world it seems at the moment is in love with things but this is the truth of money yeah. i'm not sleeping like sage is full of 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 um of beans so she she doesn't sleep she's five months old and she's not sleeping like i'm exhausted so i think it's important that those images the truth yeah. is shown out there you know and not just um look at my laugh it's wonderful and this one little part yeah. of my living room that looks amazing and the rest of my house is a joke like yeah i mean look at the mess here <laughs> <laughs> that's not so bad at all <laughs> two dogs on the floor and <laughs> love that love that but i do yeah i i think that's and maybe then you know davina is going to be somebody who is maybe she is you know already but will be more su super successful because and again because back to your very start point of authentic but I, you know having that and then you know saying this is this is real because there are so many out there that's like you know oh my wonderful life and you know and look i do it as well on my in instagram like lovely picture of my kids and we're all happy i did post one once of like before and after where like there was an ice cream incident and it was like that's hilarious but yeah. I think, like, we, I do, you know, and, and I'm like, oh, look, you know, the smiley, happy pictures, which is great because you do want, you know, those are wonderful moments that should be shared. But yeah. I think that of, um, you know, how we kind of take ownership and, and I think seeing that and having creators that are going, actually, I'm going to, I'm telling the full story because that's then real life and people will kind of um, be drawn in, drawn into it. Um, you You mentioned B2B marketing earlier do you work with any b2b brands um no not in the influencer space no um the the b2b side for me was um in events so i was at haymarket okay. publishing pr week sd magazine yeah. and, you know did all that so that was on the event side but it is coming like i think what? it's you know it's 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 a growing space linkedin are definitely plugged into you know the creator voices in there um and as actually the entrepreneur ship side of people grow i think that element of of the b2b influencer and i'm really interested in it you know well i i think it's fascinating as well i i, I think there's a huge um a huge untapped up opportunity i don't know what it is uh, <laughs> but i do i you know i think because i think here's the thing i think in b2b and I've talked to a few people on the podcast about this. Um, I think in B2B, we somehow, when we go into B2B marketing, we have this, we create these personas in our head of people as unrealistic, you know, oh, business person, persona X, they're this, and they're in an office and they're, no, they're human beings. And they, you know, they get the train to work. They're in their car. Like, I think that reality somehow gets lost in B2B marketing. And so, you know, one hundred percent. There was someone that did it really well, like a cybersecurity company, did it really well, and they did a um, they did a marketing campaign. Campaign, I can't remember who it was, but that marketing campaign was for you know cybersecurity solutions for work, but it was TV advertising. I can't remember who it was. Because I think, like you say, what people forget is that that CTO or CISO or whoever they are, they're a human being. They're watching yeah. TV. They're reading publications. They're reading the newspaper. They're scrolling through Instagram. There's the crossover there. You're yeah. targeting them as a consumer. They're yeah. going to take that information and put it into, you know, go to work with it. And that's where I think the crossover is that people are kind of missing. And I've seen one company do it. They did it with Intel. Intel did a great pull through oh. marketing activation. Do you not remember? Intel did all that, um, sorry. I did switch that off, why it came on, I don't know, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Intel did that whole TV advertising of um, the ding ding. I can't remember what it yes. was. Yeah, now, yeah, yeah. We we couldn't go and say, you know, we couldn't go to Intel and buy a computer. But what it did for us as consumers is that we went into the shop and said, we want an Intel processor. Because yeah. that, yeah. you know, that pull through marketing piece was really, really 
genius for me. So I think it's going to be the same with the BTV side of things. Well, I hope so. Yeah, I, th- I, th- I think, well, I think probably, again, it's a, it's a thing where people are trying to figure figure it out. And, and, and you know, with pr- most things, I, again, I probably tie it to budgets are tight for people. And so that's a challenge. But I think there's probably an opportunity for people to, to test it and, and see yeah. how it might work. Um, but I think the challenge would be to be is going back to that point earlier of we're going to look to tie it to revenue attribution. And that's, I think, mm-hmm. a challenge for you know, agencies and influencers to try figure that out because yeah. without that, I think it's going to be, it's going yeah. to be a slow burner for people. Yeah. 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 You have a point. Um, before we finish, I, I did want to touch on your, your story a bit. And um, uh, it, it's phenomenal. You, you'll tell it better th- than I can, but you were, you were one of the people that not only got COVID, but got massively impacted by COVID. Hugely. Yeah. So, Actually, it's coming on to three years now this month. So I was, um, the three years have gone really quick. Um, I was one of the first people, the first wave of um, catching COVID. Still not okay. sure how. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I caught it and um, I just wasn't feeling very well and and after a couple of days we were having work done in our flat and we decided to book an Airbnb just to get away from the dust and um my husband came home and was like oh have you packed and I just couldn't lift my head and he checked my temperature and it was like 39.4 and he was like not panicking let's just go by the hospital on the way to the Airbnb okay. So when we got in there within five minutes, the doctor came and saw me and said, oh, we think we're about 90 percent sure you've got the virus and the best way is for your lungs to rest. So we're going to put you into an induced coma. At that point, I was so exhausted. And and also they didn't know then because it was right at the beginning. It was like February. Oh, right. Um, oh, wow. Um, March, March, the beginning of March. Um they didn't know that actually maybe ventilation wouldn't be the best thing to do. So I, I literally signed the form. I was like, yeah, sure. No worries. Signed the form. Sadly was told to go home and uh, isolate for a couple of weeks. And um, I woke up. I don't remember anything, but after signing that form, I was so exhausted. I think I just passed out, but I woke up and it was like four, five weeks later. Oh, and I thought it was 40 hours later. Um, Oh. And then, yeah, so basically a couple of weeks after they ventilated me, um, they induced me into the coma. They phoned um, Dudley and said to him, she's not going to survive the day. And then another consultant came in from another hospital, decided to try a different treatment called oh. ECMO, which basically is a machine that cleans your blood. So takes your blood, drains your blood from your body, cleans it, oxygenates it and puts it back into your body. And there was only 16 machines in the UK at the time. I was the second person to be put on to the machine. Um, And luckily for me, it worked. And yeah, um, when I woke up, when they took me off that machine, I was meant to be um, ventilated for another three weeks. But after a couple of days, I kind of woke up myself. They started turning down the gases and I woke up and if I'm honest, I, I, I'm so lucky um, mm. because when you go on ECMO, you lose, like, your extremities gradually die because the blood's drained from your whole body and you've got these machines keeping oh. all your organs going. So a lot of people that have ECMO end up with amputations from the foot to the no. to hands and stuff. So literally the, the worst that I've come out is that I've lost a lot of hearing on my right side. I've got a frozen shoulder and I've got some nerve damage on my left leg. But me, I'm someone out there was looking after me. Oh wow! Yeah. Oh my god, that is phenomenal. How how has that changed you? I mean, that like there's such a huge thing to go through. Um, massively. Um, I still I'm still seeking 
I think one of the things that I realized is that I've got purpose in life and I'm not entirely sure what that purpose is yet and I feel like that's why I was you know came through this and the the big person saved me Mm -hmm. and chose me out of all the people that were in you know any um in intensive care they chose me I was the only Mm -hmm. person chosen for that operation and for that opportunity so I'm still seeking my purpose and maybe it will become clear now or maybe it will come clear in the future I don't know but I think for me it's just taking every day as a, a true blessing and enjoying life and living for now um yeah I I just as as the doctors always say you're so positive and I'm like oh I'm alive <laughs> Yeah, and it, it's amazing, and you know, your and maybe your purpose is, is is what you're doing because you're you're connecting people, you're finding a way to bring communities together, and in in a very authentic way, and you you know, maybe. you're maybe maybe that that's it, and that's you know, I I think there's a wonderful thing there, and you're helping you're helping people, like in a way, like I know sometimes when you're in a business, you don't often see. The broader picture i'm not getting real purposeful on you but i just think maybe maybe this is this is it and if people have a better understanding of each other and communities as a result maybe. of your work yeah, maybe. maybe this maybe, maybe this is your purpose i don't know maybe i i mean for me like there's a lot of people that come to me that i had a conversation with um a girl yesterday and i said i asked her you know we're not taking any any talent on at the moment but I said to her, are you looking for management? And she said, oh, I, I, you know, I'm not really in the position to take on management yet because I can't afford it. I'm like, what do, you, what do you mean you can't afford it? I said, you don't pay for management. I said, you know, it's a payment on results. Yeah. You know, we bring you opportunities in. We take a percentage of it. And I said, and, but we put a lot of time into helping you get opportunities, et cetera. And she went, Oh, that that's not what I've been told. There's people that say to me that I've got to pay a retainer and I'm like What? Wow. Wow. It's, it's insane because influencer marketing has created, you know, so many opportunities. Yeah. But people that and I wasn't an agent before, you know, someone came and asked me to to be their agent and that's how I fell into this space. But my background is sales. My background is sponsorship. My background is building relationships. So it's it's transferable skills. Mm. Um, but when I'm hearing this, like people want to charge talent to be on their books, come on. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that's shocking. That, and so there you go, right? You know, it, you weren't able to take her on, but she's gone away knowing, don't yeah. work with those people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and um, Vanessa, thank you so much for your time today it's been wonderful speaking to you um you are an incredibly positive person just even in this exchange here you've got a a wonderful um energy about you and i wish you the best of success with with get stuff done and the work that you're doing i i, I genuinely believe that it's hugely important and you know i say maybe this is maybe this is the purpose maybe no thank you thank you for having me thank you for for asking me to come on. I really, really loved it. So, yeah, anytime. <laughs> Thanks a million. I love when Vanessa talks about being an influencer. I do influence people, namely my husband. I thought that was great. And as I said at the end, I find Vanessa to be an incredibly positive person. She radiates energy when you talk to her. We certainly work in a world now where being able to prove ROI is essential. That's not new, but I think it's definitely more and more important. And I think this is probably something that needs to be worked on a bit more for the influencer space to get closer to that. But at the same time, understanding the place it has in your marketing mix is important to figure out. It has evolved and matured, and I have seen firsthand the impact it can have on brand health metrics in a market where we have had no other brand investment. So I would love to hear your views on this topic. That's it for this episode. Thanks for listening to That's What I Call Marketing. If you did enjoy it, please do share, add comments with your feedback. You can, of course, get in touch with me and find all previous episodes on that's what I call marketing.com. Follow us on Instagram on 
that's what I call marketing. On Twitter, that's underscore marketing. And now you can watch our episodes back on YouTube. Yes, you guessed it. You'll find us at that's what I call marketing. So from me, Connor Byrne, thanks for listening. Or if you've watched, thanks for watching. And until the next episode, take, take care.